This lecture is part of a series of lectures for RAD229, MRI Signals and Sequences, offered in the Department of Radiology at Stanford University. The sixth lecture, MRI Imperfections Part 2, is broken down into three parts, and Lecture 6A covers motion artifacts. The learning objectives for this lecture include being able to list several kinds of motion that cause MRI artifacts, differentiate between steady and pulsatile motion artifacts, explain why motion artifacts are apparent in the phase encode direction and less so in the frequency encode direction, and describe several methods to mitigate motion artifacts. In this image here, this is using real-time magnetic resonance imaging, a topic that we'll touch on in later lectures, but using ultra-fast imaging methods, we can see that the human body undergoes a wide range of dynamic motions during breathing. You can see the lungs moving up and down, you can see the liver moving up and down, as well as seeing the heart fluttering away uh, quite quickly. This is sped up relative uh, to real physiologic time. In imaging, well, we encounter cardiac motion, and that's on the order of about a hertz, and spans, say, something like one to 10 millimeters uh, of, of uh, motion displacement. We also have blood flow, and that's on the order also of about a hertz, and spans about 10 to 100 centimeters per second. And of course, there's many, many different kinds of underlying motion, including respiratory motion, bowel motion, patient motion, uh, and swallowing, uh, and so forth. And so when imaging a particular target territory, uh, it's very likely that there will be moving, or motion, moving tissues or motion uh, in the field of view. Uh, and if not appropriately uh, uh, accounted for, this can lead to imaging artifacts. And here we see these two uh, real-time examples again. So why is motion a problem in MRI? Well, I think the most basic reason it's a problem is that MRI is comparatively slow in terms of its image acquisition relative to the speed of the physiologic motion events. So as a simple example, we can think of a TR, the time it takes to acquire one line of case space, being about five milliseconds. We may need 128 lines even for a intermediate or modest resolution image. And the total temporal footprint to acquire that much data would be about 640 milliseconds, uh, just over half a second. And in just over half a second, a lot can happen. There can be substantial amounts of, of uh, uh, physiologic motion. So we record uh, the signal in the case-based domain, and that's important to remember because how motion impacts image quality uh, relates directly to what's happening uh, uh, in case-based or where we are in case space during the, the moment of image acquisition. We're not directly acquiring our data in the imaging domain. Now, frequency encoding is fast. We know that imaging requires both phase and frequency encoding. And the time to acquire a single K point in the readout direction is on the order of about 10 microseconds. Phase encoding, other, on the other hand, is quite slow. And the time in between phase encode steps is on the order of you know, many milliseconds, if not much longer. And so there's clearly uh, quite different sampling rates in the frequency encode and phase encode directions, and this will contribute to uh, different artifacts. So motion encoding uh, is actually uh, less of a problem in the frequency encoding direction, in part because frequency encoding is, in, in, in fact, so fast. So why is frequency encoding fast? Well, the K points that we acquire uh, during imaging uh, are acquired very quickly and the dwell time is only about 10 microseconds. And interestingly, in a period of about 10 microseconds, the transverse magnetization will undergo you know, many hundreds of cycles of precession uh, in this example here at one Tesla. Uh, and this is a good thing to uh, conceptualize if, you're, if you don't have a familiarity uh, with thinking about what the spins are doing during the readout of case space, uh, do a thought experiment to see if you can help understand these numbers based simply on the gyromagnetic ratio. Uh, in the, ex, uh, the external V0 field. So once we, spick, uh, once we pick a dwell time, or in fact we might pick uh, the readout bandwidth instead uh, in terms of frequency, uh, that leads us to design, uh, say, the gradient amplitude that we need for a particular field of view. And so what we notice is that the gradient amplitude is directly related to our dwell time. And so stronger gradients will allow us to uh, dwell for shorter periods of time. Uh, and, and slow gradients will have us dwelling for very short periods of, uh, very, uh, for longer periods of time. And so here's an example of two gradient waveforms being played out. And if we back this up and play it again, 
observe how the gradient waveform is moving us quickly across k-space for the green gradient, but it's moving us slowly across k-space for the gray gradient. And so depending on exactly how we've designed our gradient waveform, we will move quickly or slowly across k-space. And fundamentally, stronger gradients move us across k-space even faster. But if we move across k-space very fast, we also have fewer cycles of precession during every k-point acquisition, and this contributes to lower signal-to-noise. So there's trade-offs, as there are with most parameters in MR. So frequency encoding is fast, but there's also no spoiling between the k-points. So phase accumulation carries over. And any phase accumulation during readout will actually contribute to spatial blurring. Uh, mathematically, we can actually see this uh, through some rather complex mathematics as a broadening of the point spread function. You also um, can incur a so-called displacement artifact due to motion between excitation, which happens at the beginning of the TR, for example, and the time of readout, or the echo time, which occurs later in the TR. And the, and the time difference between uh, excitation and readout uh, uh, compounds with the underlying velocity to lead to uh, a displacement artifact of spins. So why is phase encoding slow? Well, typically one echo, that is one phase encode step, is acquired per excitation. And the excitation only happens once per TR for a typical sequence, which is on the order of about five or even as long as 500 milliseconds. And the minimum TR, that is how quickly we obtain individual echoes, is constrained by many things, including hardware, physiologic limits, uh, encoding specifications, desired image contrast, and sampling requirements. So phase encoding is slow, but interestingly, uh, spoiling between the TRs limits the phase accumulation errors. And so uh, for static objects, or for uh, some objects, uh, the phase accumulation can lead to very little uh, artifact in the phase encode direction. So there's no accumulation of phase uh, directly, uh, and therefore there's no direct blurring in the point spread function. Now, something quite different happens when we think about object motion uh, um, occurring while k-space is being acquired. Okay, quick quiz. So which of the following is true about MRI encoding? You can pause the video and think about this, and then I'll proceed to provide a, an answer. So here we know that frequency encoding is fast and phase encoding is slow. And this is a good reminder uh, to of the topic that we were just covering previously. So let's observe or, or, or uh, work out some examples of what's happening if the object is moving during imaging. So in this example on the left-hand side here, the patient has held their breath. This is an axial, an axial image uh, showing the chest wall and the back, and this is a view of the liver. And so this is what I would consider to be a, an adequate quality uh, T1-weighted image. On the other hand, if the patient is breathing, uh, there can be substantial anterior posterior, that is sort of up-down uh, motion artifacts that completely obscure the ability to sort of see any of the important underlying anatomy. Uh, now, interestingly, uh, we'll learn a little bit about this uh, as, as the lecture proceeds. We can do what's called swapping the phase and frequency encoding axes. And so we've asked the scanner to frequency encode up down, or AP rather, uh, and phase encode left right. And in doing so, while the patient is free breathing, uh, the artifacts are substantially mitigated because uh, the breathing motion is largely in the anterior or posterior direction more so than left right. And while this image quality is certainly uh, non-diagnostic, uh, it does demonstrate uh, the image quality or artifact differences between two acquisitions obtained during free breathing uh, when we swap the phase and frequency encoding axis. And so this is one approach that can help mitigate motion artifacts uh, when you're dealing with moving subjects or moving objects. So why does this happen? Well, here's a nice example. This movie was lent to me by uh, Kyung Sung at UCLA. On the left-hand side, we have an object that's undergoing slow bulk motion. And on the right-hand side, we have a case-based trajectory. So imagine that this object is moving while the data is being acquired. And the case-based trajectory is such that we're filling from the top of case-based to the bottom of case-based. So watch again as the object moves up and the case-based acquisition moves from top to bottom. So they're in opposition to one another, one another if you will. If we take the Fourier transform of the, of the acquired case-based data, 
uh, during object motion, we get an image that looks similar to the images I showed you previously, where there's clear and distinct uh, motion artifacts that obscure you know, information or uh, your ability to see features in the underlying object. So why is this happening? Well, let's break it down a little bit more. We can look at the K data that accords with uh, the object when it's in this low position. So this is before the object has moved or it's moving so slowly that we can acquire many lines of K-space. And not surprisingly, those high spatial frequency lines of K-space uh, uh, result in an, ob uh, in an image that just shows some edge information related to the object that we were trying to image. Now in the next frame, the object has moved up slightly, but the K-space trajectory has moved down slightly. And we recover again sort of an intermediate spatial frequency image of the underlying object. Uh, but if you look carefully, you'll see that the position of, these low, of this low spatial frequency image information has shifted relative to the information that was obtained previously. When we move to the middle of K space, the object has now moved to approximately the middle of the field of view. And as the middle of K space accords with the high contrast uh, uh, imaging information, then the image that we obtain from it is, is nominally uh, of good quality in terms of image contrast, but it's uh, lower quality in terms of uh, spatial resolution because it's absent the edges of K-space. Uh, and this, of course, represents an image of the object uh, in its approximate position, which is near the middle of the, of the field of view. So we continue through to the other two steps of this, and at each phase, we get slightly different imaging information that fairly represents the location of the object at the time at which it was imaged. Now, unfortunately, we have one composite case space, and we, when we composite the case space, and it's just a linear transformation to recover the image, uh, similar to adding up all of these individual images, we of course get the artifacted image, uh, which shows uh, different spatial frequencies uh, uh, um, at different spatial positions within the object. And so this is, in some sense, fundamentally the origin of where these phase encoding artifacts come from. So that was the case of steady motion. What if we look at periodic motion? So here is a cardiac MR image wherein we have periodic motion. That is, uh, the heart, of course, is beating uh, with, a, with a relative uh, period of about a second or a frequency of about one hertz. And of course, our imaging sequence is running uh, uh, at the same time. And so we'll have periodic motion from, say, the heart or the blood flow. Uh, and then that may or may not be synchronized with our case space acquisition. So in this case here, imagine an object similar to what we had before, where we have a stationary object that's in the background, if you will. And then we have a pulsatile object that's in the foreground. And that pulsatile object is fluctuating in signal intensity uh, as a function of time. Uh, and this is a consequence of so-called the inflow effect. So inflowing or out of slice spins have so-called full magnetization. They haven't seen excitation pulses yet. And so they're bright relative to the stationary or within spins that see many RF pulses. So the within slice spins are saturated after having seen dozens of RF pulses, but the new blood that arrives in the slice at the time of imaging is full magnetization and consequently looks brighter. But because the velocity of that uh, may be pulsatile, that effect can actually fluctuate as well. So now if we have linear phase encoding from top to bottom during, uh, while trying to image an object uh, with uh, periodic uh, motion, uh, we will get some interesting artifacts. And in this case, the, the background object is seen uh, quite well, but we get this flow artifact uh, in the phase encode direction that sort of looks like replications of the, of the periodic uh, flow uh, object that was in the uh, original uh, domain here. So let's take this apart and see if we can understand better why an artifact would look this way. So we borrow from the same kind of uh, idea we had before. We can separate the two underlying objects into a static object and a pulsatile flow object. The case based data for the static object, of course, would be constant with time because it's not changing. But the, the case based data for the pulsatile object would actually have a sort of banded form. And the composite of this sta uh, stationary or static object case base and the pulsatile pulsatile object case space will, of course, combine uh, to, to, uh, um, to give us an artifacted image. So the Fourier transform with a pulsatile object uh, will have this sort of spread out um, uh, appearance uh, 
uh, in the phase encode direction, which superposes with the static object to produce the final artifacted image. If we change uh, the frequency of this object, uh, the, uh, the frequency of the pulsatile flow artifact, then the frequency of the banding in, in the, as a parenting case space here will also change uh, uh, in relation to the speed at which we were traversing case space. And then again, if we combine these two images together, we'll get a different pulsatile flow uh, artifact, uh, which will superpose into the static object to produce something uh, that, that, that looks a little bit different. So there's other kinds of uh, artifacts that we can have. Uh, this is an example of respiratory motion artifacts. So if the patient is breathing uh, while at the same time the heart is beating, uh, the image quality can be quite poor. Uh, so on the left-hand side here, we have a free breathing acquisition of about 15 seconds. So the imaging system is actually synchronized to the cardiac cycle, something we'll talk about in the next lecture, uh, but the patient is free breathing. One way to mitigate the relatively poor image quality is actually through signal averaging. So if we just acquire, say, four repetitions of the same acquisition, uh, then those relatively incoherent uh, motion artifacts uh, can average out to give you a slightly better uh, image quality appearance. Uh, and while not perfect, it compares more favorably to the, to, to the conventional breath hold scan, which is shown on the right-hand side. So conventionally, if we ask patients to hold their breath for brief periods of time, 10 or 15 seconds, then of course that's a good way to, uh, to mitigate the uh, underlying motion artifacts. Okay, so quick quiz. A pulsatile blood flow artifact is obscuring a critical region in the image. What of the following is unlikely to help solve the problem? You can pause the video while you think about this and look through the answers, and I'll proceed in a second to, to discuss this. So we could increase the field of view, and that would obviously give us uh, sort of more space around the object, but that seems unlikely to do anything specifically with regards to blood flow artifacts. Whereas we've seen that swapping the frequency and phase encode directions could push the artifact into a region of relative uh, uninterest, so that it overlaps with something that's not of, say, relevance to the observation or, or measurement that needs to be made. We know that we could increase the number of averages, and through signal averaging, we can push down incoherent artifacts. And it may, in fact, actually help to rotate the field of view slightly. So rather than swapping phase and frequency, sometimes just rotating by 10 or 30 degrees is, is sufficient. So in this case, I would say increasing the field of view is not going to specifically help. So in summary, we discussed several kinds of motion uh, and how they can uh, cause different MRI artifacts. And in particular, we looked at study and pulsatile motion artifacts. Moreover, motion artifacts are more apparent in the phase encode direction and less apparent in the frequency encode direction. And we didn't get into the mathematical details of why this is the case, uh, but it is interesting to explore that topic. We also learned that motion artifacts can be mitigated in several ways. And lastly, I'll just point you to this as a reference. There's some great material here if you want to better understand the impact that motion has, for example, on the point spread function of an MR imaging system. So now that we know a little bit about how motion can corrupt images, we might begin to think about how do we compensate for motion in MRI. And for that, we'll turn to the next lecture. You can click the links below and join us again for RAD229, MRI Signals and Sequences. Thank you.